Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Feeder Live. I'm Paige Oaken, and I'm here with Allison Shea. This is the very first live broadcast of a wellness and lifestyle blog that I started a few months ago. So tonight, the American Association is producing us, and we have a great lineup of guests in our Halloween themed evening. Um, but before we get into that, um, I just wanna tell you a little bit about the theater. As I said, I started a few months ago, um, just to give myself a brain break from everything that was going on in the world. I felt like there was a little too much um, negativity in my news feed and in everything else that I was reading. And I just couldn't take it anymore. So I reached out to a bunch of friends and I said, hey, I have this idea for a little newsletter. Would you come along with me on this journey and give me some content for free and just out <laughs> of the goodness of your heart? <laughs> and everybody agreed. And so everybody that you'll meet tonight on this call has contributed in some way or another. And if you check out our website at thefeederfeed.com, you'll see some more great content and some people that you probably already know. So the only rules we have here are we never say the two P words, politics or pandemic, that's it. I said them, we're not doing it again. And everything else is just going to be fun, positivity, and joy. So the first thing we're going to do this evening is have <laughs> Devin and Amy, who are wearing some lovely chapeaus, uh, mix up a few cocktails for us to kick off the evening. So what are you mixing up tonight? So drinking is bringing us joy. So we're actually going to do two cocktails tonight. Uh, the first one we're going to start with is called the Corpse Reviver number two. I didn't realize it before this, but there are like different numbers of Corpse Revivers. I think it's kind of like Pim's Cup where there's Pim's one, two, depending on what the liquor is. We're doing number two. My assistant will get my glasses that have been chilling in the freezer. So they have that nice frosty look to them. And I will admit, I pre-mixed some of this just so that it wouldn't take so much time, but I'm going to kind of go through and show you what I did. So absinthe to rinse in the glasses. I kind of put it in, swirled it around, went back and forth. Uh, you don't want a lot. It's just a touch. We have a huge bottle of absinthe because our daughter went to school in New Orleans and we drink a lot of Cesarex. Uh, so in here, <laughs> you take a shot of gin. And I have to show you this. It's called Prohibition Gin. It is the cutest bottle. I bought it completely on just from the bottle because I'm a sucker for this. Shot of gin, and this makes one drink. Shot of gin, shot of orange liqueur. I used Cointreau. You can use Grand Marnier. You can use uh, Curacao, Triple Sec, any of those. Um, a shot of Lille, or we were at Junior's Bar, and they had this Kochi Americano. So I was really thrilled that we were able to find that. So I used a shot of that and then a shot of fresh lemon juice. Put it in a shaker. Where's that? Sure. Gonna shake it. Yeah. Right. Demma does most of the shaking in the house because I get tired and he insists on shaking longer than I normally would. <laughs> All right, it gets loud now. <laughs> Yeah, I always give up and he says no, no, it needs a little bit more. Nice. You can tell we've got quite a lot of bar utensils in this house. Hey, did absinthe used to be illegal in the United States? Where can you buy absinthe? I thought it was illegal, or am I just making that up? It's legal now. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right. It was illegal, and it's they, they've made it legal. And uh, Devin thought we were getting a little teeny tiny bottle, and got this huge one, which I think will probably last the rest of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> so you right. can buy that. You can buy that anywhere. Can you, why do you shake it with ice? It gives it a nice. Nice froth. Okay. So you can use any martini sort of glasses. I really like these. They're a little bit etched. They look very elegant for me. And 
here's a little bit of orange. So I'm using these mandarins that came in and I'm actually using enough, not just the peel, a little bit of the orange as well. So for that one, drop it in. Ah, oh, there went our knife, the blood knife. <laughs> it killed the pineapple. Cheers. 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 Cheers, everybody. Oh man, that is good. It's gonna be hard to wait. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that was the classy drink of the evening. The next drink is going to be the trashy, trashy drink of the evening. Paige was very skeptical of this. But, so the recipe is very easy. <laughs> you take a cup and a half of vodka, a cup of candy corn, of which I was able to find Brock's in Singapore this year for I think the first time ever. I love the way that the recipe says this because it says infuse the candy corn in the vodka for four hours. So I did that. <laughs> it looks disgusting when it's infusing because all the wax is coming off and it kind of looks like stag lights and really gross. Then you, after four hours, you strain it, get what's left of the candy, throw it out and then chill it. So I have my nice little thing here. I'm going to stir it up a little bit because it's been sitting for a little while. So again, cup and a half of vodka, cup of uh, candy corn. That's the infusion. All right, so I need the shakers again. So I tried this as well. And if anybody wants to see a photo, I have the photo that Amy did um, of the candy corn wax coming off into the vodka, that's on the website if you want to see it. Yeah, it's cute. I love candy corn. I'm dumping the concoction. And this makes, it said, uh, three drinks. Three very generous drinks. OK. Actually, that was a little bit too much, so. Yeah. And then the recipe calls for pineapple juice. I got this juice that you can find in almost any of the grocery stores here. It's pineapple, lime, lemon, and apple, because I thought pineapple was going to be a little bit too sweet. So it's three quarters of a cup of the pineapple juice. I give it to Devin to do the shaking again. Sounds disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> it actually, it tastes like the creamsicles, those orange things with ice cream in the middle when you were little. I don't know if they make those anymore, but it's kind of a one drink sort of thing. One drink is like, this is really yummy. Anything more than that, I think would be sweetness overload, but this was surprisingly good. I did try to like put the candy corn on the little toothpicks and things to make it look really festive and had no luck and got really frustrated putting the toothpicks through the candy corn and kept falling apart. So sorry, gave that up. Here's what it looks like. Very orange, very Halloween-y. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so people were asking, I put the link up in the chat for the lovely candy corn cocktail uh, <laughs> recipe and the photos. It's and good. It's a matter of taste. <laughs> where you can get candy corn in Singapore, which I have not seen before. I've seen it at Cold Storage. I've seen it at Tanglin Marketplace. So that's been exciting. It is. It's nice because they always had like off-brand candy corn before, you know, yeah. it was there, but it wasn't real candy corn. Well, Brax candy corn <laughs> that will make your teeth hurt. Yeah. And we will also put up the link to the Corpse Survivor that will drop tomorrow morning. So you can check out the website for that with Amy's Corpse Survivor tomorrow morning. And there's lots of other cocktails from Devin and Amy on the theater website. So check that out. Thank you both. Cheers. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. So next, we're going to have um, Ellie is going to. Ellie. Ellie. Well, I'll introduce Ellie, and we will hope that Ellie will turn her camera on. Oh, there she is. Hi, Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> there she is. Hi. Ellie, welcome. So Ellie is the owner of The Big Blow, which is a hair, a styling salon 
Um, she's been in the beauty industry for decades, working with some big names in the music, fashion, and movie industry. And today, when she was giving me a lovely blowout, we thought, well, we have to like, you know, unspook a five pages here since she's the she's the host. I think I'm coming in with the, from the opposite angle. I'm talking about how to not look spooky or have you know unspook your hair, right? Unspook my hair. That's right. Um, but I learned today that Ellie is going to be the hair and makeup stylist for the Master Chef competition that's coming up on yeah. TV. So when you're watching Master Chef, look out for Ellie's handiwork. So Ellie, tell us a little bit about humidity, hair, and making it less scary. Yeah, because I, you know, in as long as I've lived in Singapore, which has been about 20 years, and you know, I get asked by a lot of different people, magazines, you know, even you, uh, the page, you know, what are the tips to help hair in the humi in humidity? Because uh, even my girlfriend said the other day, oh my gosh, my hair is like scarecrow hair. And, you know, honestly, every time I think, oh, you know, haven't I, haven't I talked about this before? But honestly, it never gets old because we all just suffer so much with our hair in the humidity. <laughs> like, so... Okay, here are my best tips. So I think from being a, lo a long time living here and knowing what I know about hair. Firstly, I think the best thing to do is to keep your hair in the best condition possible. So treatments for your hair, there is just, we are overloaded in the market with hair treatments. Your hair has a cuticle, which would be like fish scales, and when your hair is damaged, they're open, making the hair fuzzy. So that's almost like you're on the back foot straight away with fuzzy hair. So once the water in the air gets into the hair, then you get the dreaded frizz. So that's your number one tip. Second one, a lot of people uh, also say to me, you know, I you know, let my hair dry naturally and it just gets frizzy. Again, you need the heat of a hair dryer. Even if it's half, you know, drying it off a little bit just to help seal that cuticle. So when you're using a hair dryer, I won't turn it on because it'll drown myself out. You really want to direct it all the way down the hair shaft. So here's why I opened the big blow and why I said to Paige, you got to come in today. A professional blowout will always look better, always, because of the angle that we're, <laughs> that we're putting the hair dryer on the hair. So your stylist or someone doing your hair will always be able to stand over and angle that nozzle of the hair dryer down the hair shaft, closing the cuticle down with the heat. Therefore, it's, it's gonna smooth the hair more. Also, they're able to get the lift, the angle with the hair dryer. Like if I'm trying to, do, even me, like I can obviously blow dry hair, but if I'm trying to do it myself, doing the back, it gets more difficult. And so I'm blasting up the hair, causing it to be spooky hair. So professional blowout <laughs> is the number one tip for me. Also, there are great products on the market, um, great oils in the hair, you know, different oils that you can leave in the hair. So here's my tip. If your hair is smooth, so if you have straight hair, you want it to, so you don't get limp hair, but smooth hair. When you are drying it out, because we all can't get our hair blow dried all the time, what I recommend is to dry it. Always put a heat protectant in the hair. Here's one here. Uh, it does help against heat. It puts a layer of coating on the hair that again helps keep, it's all about keeping that cuticle sealed. So layer of heat protectant, hair dryer, any different styling products. If your hair is straight, you want a smoothing product, so something that's got to have an anti-humectant effect in the hair, something that's smoothing, and then we're going to blow dry the hair, and when the hair is straight, you want to dry and get as much moisture out of the hair as possible. Once you've done that, then go over it with the brush. Why am I telling you that? It's so that it doesn't go too limp. If your hair is curly, which is what I have, you want to leave it as wet as possible before drying it. The little kind of tip for, and I'll go back to curly hair after, because what it does is it 
it stops it from starting to frizz out when it starts to dry. That's what curly hair does. So it's all about the products with curly hair. So I'll go back in a bit of that later. The other thing is another one of my great tips is using a little hand cream in your hair. So just take a teeny tiny, oh, I haven't even opened this one yet. Technical error here. <laughs> Sorry. This is just something I, you know, you can do it with any hand cream. Uh, just take a tiny little bit in your hands, rub it in, and just kind of put it all through the hair. Or if your hair is straight, you can just rub the tiniest bit, almost like it's right in your hands and just smooth it over the top. Helps. Yeah, a page is like, this is, life. This, could this is potentially life changing. This is life changing. Like, you know, when you go to the gym or you're in a hotel and you've yes. forgotten your products, yes. this is exactly, I needed, I have needed this tip. Yeah. yeah. Or you're out in the day and you don't have hair products and you need a hand cream in your yeah. purse. Maybe. It's not the perfect thing, but it does work. Yeah. Great. I'm done. That's it. <laughs> so it is, it's all about keeping your hair in as best condition as possible. And as you know, we are overloaded, drowned out in the market with products. I sell great products. People are always asking me, you know, do you like this? I'm like, I, I honestly can't try everything that is out there. So for making the hair straight, you want to use anti-humectant products. So something that will repel the moisture from the hair. So something like this one, which is spraying the hair. If it's a liquid form, like a watery form, this is generally better because it'll be weightless. So if your hair is finer, you want more of a, like a setting lotion, watery texture. If your hair is thick, you want something that's going to give it a bit of weight to keep it down, to stop it from, you know, a, a common thing that I often get is that your hair gets bigger if it's thicker and fuzzier so you want to add some weight so something more like a creamy texture if your hair is thicker um then if your hair is so another thing the way to uh, embrace your curls with the uh you know if to help combat humidity why not embrace the curls rather than fighting with them so that's always a good tip so i get a lot of questions for curly hair so i wore my hair curly tonight one of the best ways to defrizz curly hair is I use a treatment every time I shampoo my hair. So a heavier weighted conditioner. I brush my hair out with something I love, like a nice wide tooth comb, a really good quality brush, natural brush beforehand. So brush out the hair before you get in the shower. Wash your hair in the shower with a really great moisturizing shampoo that's going to give it some weight. Rinse it out. Do not comb it again at all. This is for curly hair. Because once you comb it again, after you're starting to separate all the hair, making it all fluff up, then you need to put some curl lotion, whether it's a, a leave-in cream or a, a, like a bit of a hold. You need something to bind around the hair to stop it from frizzing and to coat it. So then I put a little bit of this in the hair take out the moisture in the hair with a low heat, like a diffuser. And then after that, just let it dry naturally. So that's your, that's your, that's your curly hair tip. Other great products on the market now are, well, of course, straightening irons. They seal the hair. We always love a good straightening iron. The other one, you see a lot of them around now, these smoothing brushes, these are fantastic for, uh, over um, for just, you know, blowing out. When you've had a blowout the next day, just sealing it over like Paige, this would work really well tomorrow on your hair. Like if you slept on it, just to seal the heat. Again, it's all about sealing the cuticle. Excellent. So Thank my you. Tip, Go ahead, you, uh, one more tip. My tips are keep it in as best condition as possible and moisturize it as much as you can and you're good to go. Thank you, Ellie. That is so helpful. All right, I, now I know how to look absolutely smooth and glam. <laughs> hand cream, the tip is hand cream. Hand cream, I hand it. cream. Yeah. I am so excited. Yeah. That is like my, gonna be my takeaway tonight. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good evening. <laughs> All right, so um, let's bring in Wendy, who's in her kitchen 
baking bread this evening. Hi, <laughs> Hi Wendy. So welcome, Wendy. Um, Wendy is a baker and a chef. She has worked for a Michelin starred chef and she now has her own artisan bakery where I personally think she is killing me because I, I think she makes the best sourdough bread on the island. I am completely addicted to it. I have three loaves in my freezer right now. Yeah, I, I have a I have a bad carb problem. <laughs> and tonight for our Halloween theme, Wendy is gonna talk to us about pumpkins, which are not a squash or they're not the same thing. We had a debate about this today. So Wendy, what what have you got? Is that a pumpkin or a squash? This is pumpkin. Pumpkin and squash actually come from the same family. And it's really um, a geographical thing. It's to do with the weather where, where they have more water and stuff and they call them squash. But I have a nice, healthy, fat, raw pumpkin, which I'm gonna make into a delicious dip, which you can serve for Halloween. You can put it in your children's lunch boxes. You can have it as dips with cocktails. Pumpkins are really versatile. I'll call it a vegetable, but it's actually a fruit because it's got a seed. But when you go into supermarkets here, you see it in the vegetable section. It's a really versatile vegetable. Um, you can have savouries, you can have sweet things such as pumpkin pie, you can have soups. It's just a great one to have in your fridge. Right, here we go. Quick tip about when we're gonna cut pumpkins. Whenever you cut anything on your chopping board, always make sure you put a dishcloth or a plastic mat underneath. It just prevents accidents from happening, from things sliding off and you cutting yourself with your knife. So first of all, I'm going to show you how to take the skin of a pumpkin. Some people use a peeler. I use a sharp knife. And when you choose your pumpkin, make sure you have one that's got a really nice firm skin and the flesh is really firm. So we're going to take off the flesh and the little green membrane that's underneath it. At the pumpkin. So I haven't got a massive one, so it's going to be quick. Wendy, so here we go. Should, should I ask you, can you, if you're a lazy person like I am, can you substitute canned pumpkin here? Can you substitute? Yeah, of course canned. you could. But the problem with pum, um, tinned pumpkin is it contains a lot of water. And something to remember is when you actually cook um, pumpkin, you lose about 25% of its weight in water. So if okay. you know what you're, if you're feeding the family, always take that into into. Um, into your consideration because you do lose a lot of water right when you cook your pumpkin you need to cut it so it's all sort of a fairly uniform size maybe about one centimeter square so you can see me here i'm cutting it and then i'm going to just cut it into cubes so it's easy let's do a few so you can see keeping it even there we go and so i've so as you can see, it's much easier than peeling it. And I've got it all into sort of fairly even sized cubes. So there we go, so that's my pumpkin. And the other ingredients for my recipe include um, tahini. I buy my tahini in Tekka Market. It's an Australian um, tahini. And the reason being, it's just such a lovely smooth texture. And you can see when I open the lid, you can see it, it doesn't go thick at the bottom and solid. So it's really easy to work with. So that's my tahini. I use um, a wonderful um, ingredient called pomegranate molasses, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. When I went to cookery school, and um, we had the privilege of having Yotam Otolenghi come into lectures three times, four times. And I went to do some work for him. And as I was leaving, his parting gift was a bottle of this. And so it's forever etched in my heart. And I think of him whenever I use it. Um, we have sour cream, just regular sour cream, salt and pepper, and have a really lovely spice called razzle hal nut. I spent a number of years in the Middle East when I was growing up, and I discovered it there. And everybody has their own um, different type of razzle hal nut. I guess it's a bit like coffee beans. And it's usually about 10 spices, and it's of Northern African origin. But it's really lovely. It's aromatic. Some are spicy, some are not. You can buy that here on Lazada. Very easy to get hold of. Another one is a Bart, which you can buy here. Barrett, sorry, Bart. But this one has rose petals in, depending on what you like. So it's worth just trying a few out. They're not expensive. Uh, and then for help for a nice crunch at the end, I've got a few roasted almonds. I roasted mine in the oven just at the end. 
So what you do, you plop your pump, pumpkin up and then you put it in a pan with a tablespoonful of water and uh, the razzle hull note and you mix it all around. Um, then you um, turn, put it on the, the gas hob or your hob and you must have a pan with a really secure fitting lid. And then you turn the heat up really high for two minutes. Do not remove the lid and then lit turn it down for eight minutes. So don't take the lid off at any point during that process. And then after the 10 minutes, open it up and you'll find that a tiny bit has been solidified and stuck to the bottom and it's caramelized pumpkin. And it's just fabulous. Color is flavor in cooking. So you need a bit of color. And then if you just scrape it round and the condensation from the water from the lid will help you and it'll become a bit mushy, but it'll still be quite firm. So put the lid back on and cook for a further 10 minutes on low heat. And then take your lid off and see what it's like. Mine, I cook mine for a total of 25 minutes and I've got this lovely soft um, paste. It's really lovely. I like mine with a little bit of texture. I think it adds a little bit more, it's more robustness to it. So I don't um, blend mine and get rid of all the, the pumpkin uh, pieces. So that's my pumpkin paste, so to speak. To this, I'm going to add my um, tahini. So I'm going to add a tiny bit of tahini. Here we go. I'm going to add a little bit of that pomegranate molasses. Just a little bit for flavor. And then I'm going to taste it to see what the season, seasoning is like. It may need a little bit more salt or it may not. I'm a cook that doesn't like using preservatives or coloring in anything I do. It all has to be natural. So all my dips that I make are all natural. They can be vegan if you like, um, but they're all vegetarian. So there you can see I've got my dip. It's a really lovely texture. It's smelling delicious. I'll taste it. Mmm, spicy ginger, just delicious. Now I'm gonna put it in a bowl for serving. Shame I haven't got a glass of wine, but there we go. I might have one later. We, we, we do. do. <laughs> oh, lucky you. Chef needs to be sober. So um, there's my dip. I put it in a little bowl I bought when I lived in the Middle East, which has survived all those years. Now, on the top, I'm going to use a little bit of sour cream. But if you're a vegan, you could find a, a non-dairy uh, um, product. And I'm just going to put a tiny little bit of sour cream on the top. And then I'm going to crush a few in my little bowl. Here we go. And I'm just going to put those on the top, just for a bit of added crunch and texture. Um, if you have a nut allergy, then you obviously wouldn't put those in. Um, so that adds a little bit of crunch on the top. Now then, the things you can serve it with, I've got crudities here, um, the regular carrots and cucumber. I've got some of those famous crackers that we all consume in large quantities here in Singapore, which are really lovely. And I also made some of my own sourdough crackers. Um, I had some sourdough left over, so I just cut it very finely, about half a centimeter, glossed it over with a little bit of olive oil, and then I put some Himalayan salt and some thyme, and I popped it in the oven, and I have some delicious crackers. So all I can say is I'm gonna try it, ladies. I'm gonna tempt you all. Mm. Delicious. Mr. Ottolenghi would be proud of me. Oh, that's beautiful, Wendy. It looks amazing. And so, oh, thank you. And you actually, um, you have a range of dips as well. Am I correct in that? I... Oh, she froze again. Okay, I'm going to say do. Wendy has a range I have of a dips. Range of... Oh. I have a range of dips. Sorry. Can you wait? I'm back there. I have a range of dips, they're butter bean, they're pumpkin, hummus, um, all uh, feta, red pepper. I have a huge range of dips, all vegetarian. Where can you buy them? Um, you can buy them directly from me. Um, I think we'll pay the link up in the chat. Yeah, put the link up, that'd be great. And um, one thing I forgot to put in my dip, which I've just seen now, is a tiny bit of garlic. And I wanted to show you all how to cream garlic. I roast my garlic in the oven. I don't use uh, raw garlic. These are two that I did earlier. You just cut the top off and then you put in two, three tablespoonfuls of oil and stick it in the oven at about 180 and roast them for about 20 minutes. And then you have fresh garlic. And all you do is you add a tiny bit of salt to it. And it's like this and it's just 
brilliant. It, it's, a, it's absorbed, easy. Um, it's just easy to work with. And it becomes into a paste. And there you go. Yum. So that's how you cream your garlic. I would too. I, I, I'm with Alison. Alison said she just spread that on bread and I'm, I absolutely would do the same thing. Yum. You could spread it on my sourdough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. It looks Thank delicious. You. We will definitely try the recipe. I put the link up for the recipe in the chat. If anybody wants mm. it, it'll be posted tomorrow. Lovely. Thank you to the American Association and to the feeder. Thank you very much. Thanks, Wendy. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Holly. Bye. Welcome. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> So I want dip now. I, I, blew I wish, why didn't you get a sample for us to have? I don't know. I blew that. That was a fail. So now we, get to, talk, now we okay. get to talk to Allison about books. books. Books are my favorite thing to talk about, second only to my dogs. Um, <laughs> yes. So Allison went on this quest. I, I don't know. Did you start a year ago? Well, what happened was a couple years ago, there was this, some blogger who was getting all this attention for reading 40 books in a year. And I thought, 40 books in a year? I read that in like three months. I mean, I've always been an avid reader. I love to read. I love to recommend books. I love to talk about books. And I thought, I've never kept track of how many books I've read. So maybe I'll start. So last year, I read 125 books and I kept track of all those. And this year, I thought, well, let me see if I can beat that. So I set a goal for myself to, to read 11 books a month, which would be 132 books this year. And I'm already there. So I think I'm going to probably get to 150 this year. Whoa, 150? Yeah. yeah. So, so do, you, do you not watch TV? There's... I watch everything on Bravo. I watch all kinds of TV. I work. I have two teenagers. I have a husband. Yeah. So you just want us to all feel bad about ourselves. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I read fast, but I will say my tip, and it kind of goes hand in hand with Ellie, is while I am blow drying my hair, I like to read. And I always bring my Kindle with me. So, so you read and blow dry. I do. I read and blow dry, and I never leave my house without a book. Excellent. So tonight, because we're talking about Halloween, uh, Allison has brought some spooky stories. And there yes. are a few in here that I will never read. I am <laughs> such a scaredy cat. But yes. you've read them all? I have read them all. So I, I think, you know, scary is obviously very subjective. And I think there's a whole different range of scary stories. I think thrillers are the biggest growing group of books out there. It seems like everybody wants to be the next Gone Girl. So there's tons of scary stories. So I tried to get five different books from different genres that I think are all kind of classified as scary. So I'm just going to run through these super fast, but we can put them up later. Now I think most, and I, oh, also this is a plug for our national library board in Singapore. These are all from the library. You can all join. There you go. Anyway, first book, Stephen King's It. I don't know if anybody else is a Stephen King fan out there. I am a huge fan of his. I think he's a genius. This is the scariest book I've ever read in my entire life. I had to put it down for two weeks and come back to it. I will never see the movie because it, it, it so terrified me. But it, this is, it's long, it's thick, but it's scary and it's amazing. I'm afraid of the cover. Yeah. Like I've never well, read it. I won't see it's the terrifying. movie. This Pennywise the Clown is the most terrifying you've ever created. It's Let's awful. just put it away. Okay, we're done. Okay, we're done with that. Okay. The next book, this is, I read this, this was published this year. It's called The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. This is Steel Magnolias meets Dracula. It's, I don't know how else to put this. You read this. I read this after you put it out as okay, a recommendation. I, I loved this book so I much. I thought it was hysterical. Yes. It was one of those things where I could, I, I knew these women. I mean, it was hysterical. Yes, it is laugh out loud funny, but it's also gory. It's a, it is just what it sounds like. In the 1980s, a Southern book club happens to find themselves living next door to a vampire. That sounds crazy, but it is, ingenious it's different my husband and i love this book too so for men or women it was a great book great book all right <laughs> moving on all right so my next book this is called social creature now this is sort of a different genre but i would still classify this as scary this i think is gossip girl meets single white female so this is lavinia and louisa they live in new york one is struggling one has everything this the lavinia takes louisa under her wing and it's kind of what will Louisa do to stay there? And will she go to any lengths to stay there? Spoiler alert, yes, she will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> scary, thrilling, great. Okay, this one, this is sort of my favorite genre of like a scary book because it has a quirky, funny, smart heroine. And I love that in a book that you can relate to the person. She's like maybe solving a mystery, but she's like somebody that we can relate to. And I love that about this. This is about a film editor who goes on set 
with this sort of mysterious director who has a lot of controversy around him. Somebody dies, maybe she's the target. She links up with these two t cute teenage girls who are also there and they kind of solve this mystery. It's fantastic. I could not put it down. Highly recommend it, pretty as a picture. And actually the bookmark in it is because my daughter is reading it right now and she is enjoying it as well. Okay, so then my last genre is nonfiction. And this is an older book. It's from 2017, but I just read it this year and it's called Killers of the Flower Moon. I read that. Yeah, it was good, right? It was, it was disturbing. It is disturbing. That's why we're talking about scary books because they're <laughs> disturbing. So this is gonna be made into a movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio. But basically this is the true story of the Osage Indians. And they lived in the, the members of this uh, tribe were the richest people per capita in the world in 1920. And suddenly um, they began to be murdered one by one. And it was like the, the dawn of the FBI and um, they had to come in and solve it and figure out who was killing these people. And it's terrifying and crazy and true. And that's, I kind of think what makes it even more true, more scary. So this is a great book, highly recommend this. Okay, I have one bonus book and I know we weren't supposed to say the P word. I'm not gonna say it, but this is an old book from 1994, The Hot Zone, about the Ebola uh, breakout, whatever. And yeah, I mean, not, but we're gonna call it a virus. virus. So let's okay, virus. Virus. We call it this again, another book that I had to put down and take a break from, so scary, but really sort of timely, I think at this point. So very, very scary. I think this and it probably the scariest books I've ever read. Really? You yes. You put yes. that up there with it. I put this up there with it. It was that scary. It's, it reads like a novel. This reads like a novel too. And I think that's probably my highest praise. I try to read a mix of nonfiction and fiction, but mostly fiction. But for me, if a nonfiction book reads like a novel, that's the best compliment I can give. And I would say both of those two. Excellent. Yeah. Well, we will put Allison's book, Spooky, Mystery, Scary books up on the website as well. You can take a look at that list because I'm just hearing about them for the first time tonight. So that was a bit of a surprise. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, we are going to end this evening with some spooky stories from Jane Eyer. Jane, are you there? Jane? Jane, please be there. Oh, Jane's there. Hi, Jane. Hello. <laughs> so Jane Iyer is a Brit who has lived in Singapore for quite a few years. Um, she grew up as a child in Malaysia. Her father was a BBC broadcaster. So she has been in this part of the world for a long time. She, uh, a few years ago, did a career switch and became a tour guide and opened Jane's Singapore tour to, um, to meld her passion for history, heritage, and culture <laughs> with her, her passion for growing a new business. So Jane is one of the foremost respected tour guides on the island. And she, um, she also likes all things kind of spooky and scary. I know this because I've spent a lot of time with her. So Jane, I have to ask, <laughs> You're going to tell us about all the spooky hot spots on the island, but before we go there, I need to know, have you ever had a personal spooky encounter on one of your tours? Well, okay. I have not actually seen her myself, but in driving down Mount Pleasant Road only a couple of years ago with a couple of ladies I was taking on a tour, and explaining all the interesting things about Mount Pleasant Road, many of which are spooky, not least because it's right next to Bukit Brown Cemetery. Um, and there's lots of rumors around about what happened in some of the houses during World War II, courtesy of the Japanese. But in addition to that, there is a big story about the Pontianak. The Pontianak is possibly the most famous uh, spooky character in Singapore and also in Malaysia and Indonesia. And basically she is the ghost of a lady who has died usually in childbirth. Uh, as a result of which she comes back to particularly pounce on men because she feels that they were responsible for her predicament, getting pregnant and so on and so forth in the first place. So I haven't seen her myself, but as I was driving up Mount Pleasant Road with these two ladies only a couple of years ago, uh, with a driver that they had provided, the 
driver who was of Malay origin, because Malays very much believe in Pontianaks, suddenly turned around as I was telling these stories and said, I've seen her. I went, what? <laughs> he said, uh, a year or so back, I was driving up this road at dusk and I thought there was something wrong with the tire on my car and I stopped. Big mistake. Um, and he got the classic whiff of uh, frangipani, which is what you normally get when a Pontianak is in the, in the distance, so watch out. This, by the way, we, we, we women don't have to worry about this. It's all the men who are going to get attacked. Um, and then it turns into this horrible rotten smell as the Pontianak gets closer. But anyway, he, he said he didn't smell the rotten smell. He only smelled the frangipani. Uh, but he looked at the tire and it seemed okay. So he got back in the car and he's driving up Mount Pleasant Road and all of a sudden he looks in his rear view mirror and there she is in the back seat. Yes. Uh -oh. Sitting there with, they traditionally wear white clothing and have long black hair. And her, she was sitting there with her long black hair draped over her face. And of course I said to him, well, what on earth did you do? He said, I was petrified. I just kept driving, 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 driving. And eventually after a couple of minutes, I looked again and she'd gone. So gentlemen, if you're to watching um, this, I'm sorry, this is not going to be a great quality photo, but this is basically what she's going to look like. Okay. Long black hair, white shroud sort of thing. And uh, really googly eyes, right? <laughs> but uh, the thing is, the other thing about the Pontianak is that she was a very, very, very popular figure in old movies that were made here in Singapore, particularly in the 50s and 60s. And so you can actually go online and you can find old Cathay movies, Shaw Brother movies and so forth. And they are absolute classics. They are brilliant. I mean, they're so sort of corny, very frank in so many ways, but, but they're great. But just a year or so ago, Glenn Gui brought out this movie. Sorry, it's going maybe backwards on your screen, but it's A Revenge of the Pontianak. And this is a movie that came out, um, I say, just over a year ago, and I was lucky enough to go to the premiere of it. And funnily enough, sat right behind the actress who had played the Ponti uh, the uh, the heroine in the uh, actually the Pontianak in the movie. But she said, interestingly enough, that they had filmed it up in Malaysia, in Perak, and whilst they were filming this movie, a real life Pontianak was watching them. So, so let that uh, chill your spine or something. <laughs> I literally am getting shivers. I am such yeah. a security cat. I, I'm not going to sleep tonight. Thanks so much for that, Jane. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Good. Then mission accomplished. Yeah. No, it's it's uh, it's it's sort of interesting. Uh, there's no question about it that Singapore is. Um, it, there's a lot of superstition here. It's quite endemic in the Malay culture. It's endemic in the Chinese culture as well. And in fact, just a couple of years ago, they did a survey of Singapore. Singaporeans and 68% of people said they believed in ghosts. So go figure. It's it's certainly a, it's certainly a country that believes in its traditions and also its uh, superstitions. So what are some of the hot spots around here? I mean, I've heard, you know, some of the black and white enclaves and Alexandra Hospital has some creepy things. Like what are the, you know, your top 3 hot spots for I don't know, pair paranormal activity. <laughs> yeah, there are there are actually um, rather a lot. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, anything with the cemetery involved, like Bukit Brown, would be a big hot spot, um, obviously, for obvious reasons. Um, Mount Pleasant that I've just been uh, talking about, Road, which is, of course, quite nearby, is another one. Interesting enough, Fort Canning, of course, was one of the first places that they felt there were ghosts um, at because it was the pl place that the Malay kings lived back in the 14th century. Century. So when the British came here um, in 1819 with Raffles, they wanted to clear all the undergrowth up there because nobody had lived there for many hundreds of years. And they could not get any of the local people to go up that hill because they were too scared by the ghosts of the kings. And um, eventually they had to get people to come down from Malacca to actually help to clear the hill, which is interesting. So they did. And then as years have gone by, there have been lots of stories about Fort Canning. In fact, they say even the Japanese, when they were here in World War II, didn't really like being on Fort Canning. They were pretty scared of some of the things that happened up there. So Fort Canning is, is another hot spot. But honestly, there are lots of them around Singapore. There really are, because we've had a lot of uh, activity here, shall we put it that way, over you know a, a short period of time, relatively. Um, in actual fact, another one that I think is very interesting is the Dempsey area. 
um, because that lots of things have happened around there. And uh, we're actually going to be running some Halloween tours around Dempsey, uh, as I know you know, Paige, um, this coming weekend. And we've chosen it specifically because we believe that yeah, there's activity. Um, and the lady I'm doing it with is she's quite sensitive to these things and she knows about them. And she said, yeah, this is going to be a good place to do, <laughs> to actually make maybe a bit of contact even, you know, we'll have to see. Um, so in a nice way, but we'll try to do it in an, an intelligent and empathetic way so that nobody gets too scared, including the ghosties and ghoulies themselves but there's been a lot of things that have happened around there there was um you know world war one world war two various other things um at the end yeah i mean anything to do with where the japanese were yeah you're going to find there's quite a lot of activity around those areas too so lots of areas essentially wow okay jane well um thanks so much <laughs> <laughs> My head's a little chilly. Else? <laughs> my, my spine's a little chill. <laughs> no, I think that's wonderful. Thanks so much. Oh, you're, you're uh, most, most welcome. And uh, as I say, you know, the, this, honestly, this is a huge topic and we could talk about it for hours in terms of all the different, you know, belief systems from the Malays and the Chinese and so forth. But uh, yeah, it's, as I say, I think when you approach this, you've got to, we're trying to approach it in an intelligent way so it doesn't become too sort of silly, you know. But, um, but yeah, uh, the, I do believe. I'm half Welsh. I'm, I'm Celtic, so I think I, I believe in these things anyway. <laughs> there Thank are more you. things in heaven and earth, you know. You anyway, happy Halloween, everybody. <laughs> On that do, note. Do you offer the uh, spooky tours throughout the year or just around Halloween? Yeah, we've just started them actually. It's what you know, we we do heritage and history tours as as Paige has mentioned all the time. We've done many, many different topics. Um, but it's been something that I've been thinking about for a long time because I know people are interested, you know, but it's a fascinating topic. But I was sort of a bit reluctant to do it if I couldn't find a way of doing it well. And I believe that I found the right partner in, in Danny. And uh, we're, uh, you know, we've got an interesting tour, which is a combination of history and and a little bit of the spook, you know, and the spooky as well. Um, and we're doing it, as I say, so I think in an intelligent way, um, rather than just sort of, you know, sort of silly boo-boo, which is fine for children, but uh, I think for adults, you need to do something a little bit cleverer than that. So, yeah, so it's just new, but uh, we hope that this will be the start of a series of Spooky Singapore um, uh, tours that we'll do in different parts of the island. Right. And Sentosa, by the way, as well. That's another one. Sentosa has been quite a lot of activity there because that used to be called Black and Mati, right? Death from behind. So even its name is old name. <laughs> Death from what? Death from behind is the translation. There's a couple of different translations for it. And, and the stories vary in terms of the provenance of that name. You know, it was only changed to Sentosa in the 70s, which means peace and harmony, right? Um, <laughs> which is a bit more tourist friendly. Um, prior, prior to that, it was called Pulau Blakan Mati, the island of death from behind. They, the, the most colorful explanation, and let's go with that one because it's much more fun, is that there were a lot of pirates around in those days that they lived on Sentosa or Black and Mati, and uh, they used to basically hijack um, people coming through the straits between the mainland and, and the island. And of course, their favorite modus operandi was to jump aboard with a cutlass or a knife or whatever, slit people's throats from behind. Um, so <laughs> that's the colorful explanation for the name of the island, but uh, there are more prosaic ones, but let's stick with the colorful one. <laughs> All right, and then on that note, Jane. <laughs> enough for you. <laughs> no, I, no joke. Like between the spooky book and that, like I, it's not going to sleep tonight. So, so much fun. You don't want to picture. You don't want to picture the Oran Minyak, the oily man who might come and pick. You know. No, sort of, thank you. We can. We can a nice one. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Jane. I appreciate it. So I think that's it. I think that might be a wrap for wow. the first feeder live. Wow, and only like minor technical difficulties. I mean, that was a glitch. Was it? No, I, I think can't. we're good. Yeah. I think we're good. I wanna thank the American Association for producing and uh, supporting us. I wanna thank all of my guests for joining me on this journey this evening. Well, and thank you to you, Paige, for putting the theater out into the world. I think we all need positive energy and light and laughter at this time. And I think that's exactly what you've done with it. So thank you. Thanks, Allison. Yeah. And especially thank you to all of you who tuned in and gave us an hour of your time this evening. We will be doing another theater live in two weeks. 
So be on the lookout for that. And we hope to see you then. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs>